right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. How's everybody doing? I don't need to ask y'all to do like chin jumping jacks, do I? It's like a part of the afternoon, though. I know we're hitting like the lull, and I don't think any amount of sugar or caffeine will help, so I understand that. So I'm hoping today that um, this workshop is going to be more of a conversation and really an opportunity for y'all to brainstorm because in all reality, y'all are the experts when it comes to working with students and y'all are the ones day in and day out that are now working with Generation Z. So I just ask you know, that y'all be ready to engage, to answer questions. We're going to talk a little bit about motivation and what it's like to motivate students. So don't make me pull y'all's teeth to get engaged, right? Be a little paradoxical if we do that. Um, I'm Lauren Klein. I'm a faculty member in Ag Leadership here at Oklahoma State. Um, I'm not going to give y'all a huge brief, brief background, but like my background is in Ag Ed. Um, I'm originally from Florida, but grew up in Ag Ed and received my master's in Ag Ed. Taught for a little bit before I kind of started this route of Ag Leadership. So um, it's really cool for me to get to work with them. Um, I feel like I get to be part of the gang again. Um, I want to start off today, though, with two questions. First question I have for y'all is I want you to think back to when you were a student. And let's say 10th grade, all right? Let's all get on the same page there. What things motivated you or made you excited or could convince you to do things when you were in 10th grade that's classroom appropriate? Money, okay. What else? Getting out of class. If somebody else is doing it too. So a little bit of peer pressure. Yeah. Winning. Winning. Okay. Think about as a tenth grader. Fun. If it was fun, you wanted to do it. Someone said food. Let's think about learning. Like maybe think about a class you had when you were 15, 16 years old that was an act. Maybe it was a different class, but like what made that class fun for you and something you enjoyed learning about? Recognition. Recognition? Anything else? I like working with classes like group work, hearing other people, not just teacher, one-sided, kind of student-centered. Okay, group work, student-centered, I'm going to put SC for student-centered. Anything same, else? Same projects where like you have a, an outline, but like you got to do whatever you wanted. So a little bit of freedom, yeah. right, in those projects? Okay, so that's kind of my first question, is just thinking back to yourself, what motivated you when you were a student? Okay. Now, those of y'all that have been teaching for a while, maybe you've noticed a shift, right? And a shift kind of happens with the students you teach, kind of every generation. It's roughly every 15 years or so. How do y'all describe your current generation of students? Do you know what's really funny? This side note, I get off on like tangents a lot. Any research that's done about generations, every generation gets called lazy. It's kind of funny. It's just every generation thinks the other generation's lazy. Okay, how else would y'all describe? Huh? Untitled. Apathetic. Apathetic. Untidy. Entitled. Entitled. Okay, sorry. I was like messy. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> Apathetic. Entitled. Anything else? I think they're empathetic. Empathetic. Way more than the other generation. Thank you for some positivity. I like it. Empathetic. Well, I would say sensitive, and I don't mean that necessarily in a bad way. All but I just feel like kids are really sensitive to a lot of environments and words and things. Do you feel like it's emotional intelligence? Or do you think it's awareness? Emotional awareness. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it has a, as a bad thing. So maybe some emotional awareness. One, one thing that I've noticed is that a 
a lot of them will spend way more time questioning the purpose of something than what I ever said. So they care about the why. Yes. Yeah. I like, though, that you were able to say, like, some people would say that they're just um, defensive or they like to argue, argumentative. But I like how you're kind of saying deeper that it's no, they really want to know the why. If they can just know the why behind it, then they're fine. Any other descriptions? I think they're pretty connected. Connected. In what way? So lots of meaning for that idea of being connected. Absolutely. So I hope that, you know, really my goal today as we talk about Generation Z, um, you know, I think it's important for us to start with, okay, what are our kind of assumptions or even just our experiences in working with these students? But I think before we can get to, all right, what's important for us to know about Gen Z, we need to kind of step back a little bit have like a quick overview of Motivation 101. And the reason for that is we may see some disconnects with maybe ways we've tried to motivate in the past and maybe why it's not working with this particular generation. And so then we've got to talk about, okay, what are some of those generational differences? And I'm not gonna go deep into this, but really just to give y'all the context to think about, like what's the environment that each generation's grown up in? Because that's had a lot of impact in what each generation's like. Then we're gonna tap into, okay, what are the 10 things we need to know? And then we're gonna apply that and really say, okay, what are some things we can walk out of here today, some tips and tricks that maybe we can implement in our ag ed programs to maybe work with these individuals a little bit better. So basic motivation here. I love this picture. Somebody describe for me what you see in this picture. Both are playing soccer, right? But what do we see? One's thinking about the prize, one has the prize. One's thinking about the prize. One looks like they're just having a good time. What does this remind you of? Intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. What is that? Can anybody remind us? Let's start with extrinsic. What is the extrinsic motivation? Outside the external motivation. External motivators, something outside of you. Throw me out some examples. What are from things that y'all listed that motivated you as a student? Which of these would you consider to be external motivators? Money, Money. food, awards, so even like this recognition. Affirmation, I guess recognition. Yes, absolutely. What else? Out of class. Out of class. What about peer pressure? Yeah. Definitely external motivation, right? What about winning, getting the prize? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's really easy to identify what extrinsic motivators are. So how many of y'all maybe relate with this soccer player? So you're like, yeah, if I was doing anything, I want to win. I want, I want the award, the reward, whatever it's going to be. Okay, how many of y'all more resonate with this person that you're like, I don't care if I was the suckiest person on the team, I still had a great time. Okay, why would that describe you? I just enjoy doing something and it doesn't matter the outcome, I just... You just like doing it. Okay, so, right. So how would y'all describe intrinsic motivation? Intrinsic. Could be like personal satisfaction personal satisfaction, like just this innate drive to do something just because it makes you happy and satisfied. And so for those that said, I, I liked class or I was excited in high school because it was fun, I just liked going. Is anybody else willing to raise their hand and admit that that might have been you in high school? Yeah. There were things that I just, I liked going to because maybe I really liked the teacher and it was a fun class, right? Group work, how could group work be an intrinsic motivator? Some people need just like social interaction and so. Just being able to work with other people, right? 
What about this idea? I like the fact that you said projects, right? But this ability to have freedom, why was that motivating to you? Uh, because, I don't know, like you could take it as far as you wanted to in whatever medium you were most comfortable or wanted to like uh, express yourself in. Yeah, absolutely. You kind of got this ability to personalize, yeah. right? And so you could make it something fun for yourself. As you look at the differences between these intrinsic and extrinsic motivators, I have another example that may kind of rear this in a little bit. So thinking about kids wanting to learn, because again, you're ag teachers, y'all are teaching as well as chapter advisors, you name it. So thinking about the kids that are in your classes, you know them, the ones who are highly engaged and the ones who are not. And so these two students, I think are good examples. And thinking about just the pictures itself, you have students who participate because they want to win awards, but then you may also have students who just do it because they enjoy it, right? Any of y'all know kids that, I think of my six-year-old right now, that I think the only reason he makes his bed in the morning is because he just doesn't want to get in trouble. Like he'll genuinely say, I just don't like getting in trouble. I really wish he would just do it because he likes to be tidy. <laughs> we haven't got there yet, right? Okay, some people like to compete because they know they're gonna get a scholarship. Other people say because they like the challenge. Does anybody resonate with that? You like to do things just because of the challenge of being able to show you can do it? How many kids do you know study to get a good grade versus those who study to actually learn because they're curious? Man, if we could figure that out, I wanna make a million bucks off of it. But I think that's the real kicker for us in education, right? Is how do we get students to go from just wanting a good grade to actually being curious and wanting to learn the material. We have to provide the space for them to be curious though, right? And so we've got to think about intrinsic, extrinsic motivation anytime we're working with our students. And a lot of times when we're having challenges with students, it's because we're not figuring out what motivates them. Here's the thing. I don't ever want y'all to walk away from here saying that nobody, like you just have a kid that's not motivated. We use that word lazy. Everyone is motivated by something. Everyone. So our job as educators is to figure out what motivates them. Okay? So we've got to think about that. Well, what's going to motivate them? But here's the caution we've got to think about with students. When we look at research regarding motivation over and over again, we find that the easy thing to do is to throw a carrot at it or throw a stick at it. Those are all extrinsic motivators. And what we find is that a lot of times students will start out with some type of intrinsic motivation wanting to do something. But if all we do is give them external or extrinsic motivators, so something like a reward, over time we actually do damage to just their innate desire to want to do something. <laughs> so, you know, a really good example of this is there's been studies done with kids in kindergarten that love to draw. How many of y'all like to draw as kids? right kids just if you gave them paper they would just sit there for hours and draw teacher give them free time they loved it but then the teacher said and this was a true experiment they said okay we're going to draw like we do in class every day but whoever draws the best picture is going to win twenty dollars and they started doing that and they started having that competition and what they started noticing is that kids either weren't drawing as creatively as they were before or they just stopped flat out stopped because what had happened is the teacher had taken something they loved to do that was fun to them and kind of turned it into a chore not everyone it's not saying competition's bad but sometimes we have to think about if all we do is focus on external motivations we may actually be killing students innate desire to want to learn and to be curious and do things i say all that because what do we jump to a lot in education huh we jump to conclusion. What's the easy way to try to motivate kids? Grades? Food? We, we go to a lot of extrinsic motivators, right? So I just want us to keep that in the back of our minds as we talk about different generations because I think y'all are going to really see a difference in Gen Z as to what we know motivates them. And it's going to tie into this principle quite a bit. 
Again, some things about this carrot and stick approach. It hurts intrinsic motivation. It actually makes performance lessen over time, crushes creativity. And creativity is essential to problem solving, and y'all know we have a lot of big problems in the world. And so we want to have students who can think creatively to be able to solve those. It crowds out good behavior. What do you think we mean by that? How can extrinsic motivators kind of curb good behavior? Doesn't matter what the damage is, yeah. But if there's only so many people that can win or can get recognized, what students may just naturally do is behavior, they don't see the purpose in it anymore, right? Um, <laughs> this is an interesting one. It's been found over time that the more external motivators we use actually causes people to cheat more, take shortcuts, and have unethical behavior. Well, you don't see that in livestock showing ever, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Same from personal experience. Um, becomes addictive. It's like that idea we just want more. It's like eating sugar, right? Have a tablespoon one day, you want two tablespoons the next day, whatever. And it creates short-term thinking. So again, it works in the short term, but long term, it doesn't create people who have an intrinsic motivation themselves to want to do things. So there's some negative repercussions to that. So now, generational differences. And again, I told y'all I'm not gonna like harp on this a ton, but just it's important for us to think about. This is really the first time ever in history that five generations are living together. Never happened before. So we still have folks from the silent generation that are still living. Um, I saw just the other day that the last Tuskegee Airman died. He was 102. But we still have folks from the silent generation around that are alive. And so if you think about what did they grow up in, you know, they're known as the greatest generation, but they went through the Depression. They went through World War II. Any of y'all have family members still living that went through this era? What are some ways you describe them? Uh, our My papa hides money around the house. Yeah. Like, you find it in the weirdest places, right? Like, all going back to the context they were raised in, right? Okay, then we have boomers, 1946 to 1965. I'm not gonna make anybody raise their hand and tell us what generation you are, we won't do that. But if we think about the time that boomers grew up in, a lot of political instability. Y'all, if we think there's a lot of that now, we ain't seen nothing, okay? We've gotta think about that. Um, they went through the Vietnam War, the Cold War, civil rights. They were also the first generation in our country to really experience a sense of affluence. So having enough money to really live by and seeing that stability. So again, that kind of influences their outlook on the world. Then we have Gen X that was born in 1965 to 1976. A lot of times this gets called the forgotten generation um, because they're in this weird point where a lot of boomers are staying in positions and not retiring. So they're not getting a lot of the leadership positions that may have come. So they're kind of just working getting to retirement and going. Like you're not really seeing them fill a lot of leadership roles. Um, they're also known as the latchkey generation. Went through the 1980s recession. And so, you know, kind of experiencing that, oftentimes being born to parents that kind of knew kind of some stability when it came to economics, they tend to be very ambivalent politically and also very cautious. So you're gonna notice something similar that kind of skip generations a little bit. Gen X tends to mimic some same traits of our silent generation. Then we get our millennials, 1977 to 1995. This is the first global generation that grew up understanding that the world is interconnected and had access to the whole world. But also went through, you gotta think about it, the Great Recession, so started in 2008. Also the generation that grew up post 9-11. And so going through that, going through the Great Recession, they really haven't known a whole lot of stability when it comes to economics, nor when it comes to the job market. So because of that, they tend to have pretty high expectations um, when they are in the workplace, just because of that. And then we have our Gen Z, or what I'm calling the Zoomers, because they've known Zoom now, like all of us for two years. Um, but they were born in 1996. They weren't, most of them weren't even born 
when 9-11 happened, they've just grown up in a world post. So like, they didn't know what it was like to go through the airport and not take their shoes off. <laughs> All of that has seemed very normal to them. There also are digital natives. I will ask how many of y'all in this room remember the first time you ever used high-speed internet? Or let's even go back further, dial up. I can still hear like the AOL sound, like in my ear, you know? This generation's like, what did y'all do before the internet, right? Like, it's all they've known. Um, they're also the most diverse generation. So because of globalization, groups and cultures have moved around more than ever before. So generations are very diverse. They're used to ease of access, and they're very values-driven. This reminds me a lot of saying that see them as someone who cares about the why. Oh, no, I'm not going to change it. Okay. So some interesting similarities and differences across. The thing I want to point out, though, is that oftentimes, if we were to dive deeper into these generations, we would find that they usually value the same things. Every one of these generations, when they're surveyed, says they value family. All of them say that they value taking care of their community. It's just how they behave on those values are different. And so I think that's something important too to think of when we start comparing them, is that we've just gotta get down to seeing what are the things that we value the same. Um, why should we care? Getting to why of this. Y'all already in the workplace, they're a quarter of the workplace. So you've already had them graduate out of your programs, and they're just going to keep coming, these Gen Zers. Um, it's a, interesting because not a lot of workplaces, yeah, I would say, I don't even know that colleges were ready for it. They're still focused on millennials, not realizing that millennials have already been working for 10 years, <laughs> most of them. So it's important for us to be talking about this. So 10 things that we need to know about Gen Z, okay? Important things to know. They are fidgetal. And this is a weird word. It's a real weird word. But I think this, these two pictures highly demonstrate what we mean by fidgetal. And it means that they coexist in both a physical and a digital world. So everything that they do in person, they want things to be in person. They value that, but then they also want to talk about it online. If they came to this workshop today, they would love being in person. But then they also want to be able to rewatch it when they get home on YouTube. So there's this expectation for Gen Zers that things are both in person, but then also in a digital space. And so we've got to be thinking about what does that mean to us as educators? How are we providing things to students? Um, what are y'all's thoughts on this? Have you seen this in your own program? How many of y'all like sometimes just want to say, put down the phone and enjoy what's happening? But to them, sharing it online is just natural. That's part of what they want to do. Do you see that guy that got the Nicole Holter sponsors it because he's the only one watching Tiger Woods actually get the ball and not videoing it? Anybody else do that? Yes. Yeah. Hold on, say that louder. What happened? This guy, it was at, I don't know what, I don't know what tournament, I don't watch TJ and Tiger Woods was hitting a, oh, it's at the and so there was a picture of the whole crowd, every single one of them had their phones up, you know, like this, and this guy just had a big ultra in his hand, and he was just standing there watching it, like, in awe, and every, I mean, like, dozens of people, everybody else had their phone up, so big old ultra apparently gave this guy a sponsorship. That's some awesome. Sort of, like a, he got some sort of deal with big old ultra to do advertisement. Yeah. But he actually yeah, was yeah. just enjoying it. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, what do you say to administrators who are probably more from my generation that are totally getting rid of your phones? I get so sick of fighting phones yes. at school when you're saying that's what these kids need or want. Mm -hmm. It becomes more of a distraction, like more of a distraction to try to take them away than it is just to say, "I know you have your phone, this is on the desk." Right? Or, you know, like set boundaries. So I would say, you know, oftentimes having that hard line, I think of it like a parent. Sometimes the more I say no, the more my kid actually wants to do something. But if I say, "Okay, I allow it," but here's the boundaries we're setting, 
most students abide by that. And even, I mean, has anybody else experienced that? Like, what do y'all schools do? And their minds like hard work. Hard work. They're like, they don't even want to see them. Right. They don't want to see them in their pockets. Mm -hmm. You know, what I have heard from teachers that has been successful is setting and communicating what the boundaries look like, finding ways to integrate them to help them see how it can help learning, and keeping them on task with that to where then they aren't just spending extra time on Snapchat in class, or what have you, but utilizing them in a productive way in what they're doing. Has anybody had success with that? Anyone? What works for you? Well, like, my kids know, a kid is talking to their phone, you're not on your phone, so there's like a time and place for it. Yeah. But then I'll tell them, like, for more than I'll tell them, like, this is something you can use your phones on, or we're not using our phones on this, and they're really good reasons for that. Yeah. It's kind of just creating that norm. Absolutely. I've seen some people, like, they put, like, a calculator pocket thing and put phone chargers in it, so, hey, oh. keep your phones out, but we'll put it on a charger while teaching the lesson or whatever. Yeah, that's a good idea. But then, but then you, then again, you open yourself up. Okay, well, then who's watching the phones while you're teaching? You know, something's happening in class. Yeah. What happens if it gets stolen? Absolutely. Like that. <laughs> yeah. No, I understand that. No. So the second thing that we know about Gen Z is they are hyper custom. So this generation hasn't known anything but being able to choose and mix and match and do things the way they want. So I think about Hideaway Pizza, the pizza you can order that has one slice of everything. That's like their favorite, right? Or would be their favorite. But that's what they want. And here's what's interesting is like, honestly, they've experienced, they're experiencing a job market where in a lot of ways they can create and negotiate some of the requirements of their job. So it's kind of an expectation for this generation to kind of not completely like throw everything out with the bathwater and start over, but to say, well, maybe I want to do something this way. They want to be able to negotiate. And so, you know, one of the first things I think about application of this is how might this impact officer responsibilities? I don't know, you know, everybody runs their officer teams differently, but my chapter, we had very specific duties that each office had. And I know even FFA lines that out, right? We have it in the manual. But could there be some flip flops some sharing, some customization that might make students enjoy it a little bit more. So ultimately you're saying that in the job market, these students want the autonomy to come up with their own job description? In some ways, yes. And some places are providing that. It's wild. <laughs> I say that coming from one that I don't have the autonomy to do that. <laughs> they need to have it their way. In some ways, yeah. I mean, think, but, but think about it. But think about it. They go to McDonald's, right? And a lot of McDonald's have the kiosk that you order from now. And you get to just pick and choose. And you don't even have to go off what the menu item actually is anymore, right? So they're just completely used to, again, like, may not be able to see how this realistic play, realistically is going to play out for them later on in life. But we've got to identify that this is the world they've grown up in with most things. And so for them, they don't know why that wouldn't apply to everything and not just their order at McDonald's because that's what they've experienced, okay? This generation is actually, because of that ability, they tend to be more entrepreneurial, believe it or not. And again, I want y'all to think back to intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. You may be saying, I'm not experiencing a lot of students who are entrepreneurial. Well, has that curiosity and creativity been crushed out somewhere? Have they been given the space to be? Because in spaces where they are, they are actually found to be pretty entrepreneurial because they want to create that customization. They don't like what a job posting says. They'll create the job themselves and do the create the company themselves, and they'll take the risk doing that. Um, and again, you think about why would they do that? Well, they haven't really known a whole heck of a lot of stability. So to them, the stability of a company or a job that's been around for a while doesn't mean a whole lot to them, okay? FOMO, fear of missing out, <laughs> okay? But, you know, beyond just it being one of those that, like, 
they see things on social media and they get sad if their friends are doing something without them. It's not really that type of FOMO we're talking about. Gen Z has FOMO in the sense of they don't want to miss out on trends. Okay, I put some things up here that are trendy. How many of your high school boys are growing mustaches? Anybody still? Or beards, because they can't, right? Bucket hats are back, y'all. Still don't understand that. Tennis shoes with dresses for girls. Really, I saw someone in prom dresses around here earlier in the spring with tennis shoes on. It's very interesting. So you're saying that this generation is more worried about missing out on trends and what everyone else is doing instead of experiences as a whole. Right. Like they're constantly looking and trying to discover what is the next thing because they don't want to be seen without it. So what is the next cool social media app? Right? Like, I joke that, like, by the time I finally decided to use Snapchat, that wasn't the thing anymore. Or whatever. But no, nope. Gen Z, they're on top of it. They probably have 10 apps on their phone that y'all don't even know what they're used for. Right? So they are constantly trying to find out what is the next trendy thing so that when it does become popular, they've already got it. This is an interesting one. They're considered we economists. And what we mean by that is that, again, business to, businesses to them haven't always been traditional businesses. It's been kind of this entrepreneurial spirit that, like, okay, if I don't like how taxi companies are doing their thing, let me just use my car as a taxi. Let me call it Uber. Let me just start picking people, right? Like, that's all they've known. Uber, Airbnb, Etsy, eBay. Just this ability where you don't have to go through a third party to necessarily get the goods and services you want is something that they are used to and also kind of the way they think of like so if there's a lot of red tape or a lot of hoops that they have to jump through for things that can like they don't like it they want there to be clarity and they want it to be as streamlined as possible and that's just because of the businesses that they're used to right so they're do-it-yourselfers um, it's interesting. I was talking to one of my students that's interning for a horticulture company um, this summer, and she was telling me that she actually got in trouble by her supervisor because her supervisor told her to build some trellises. What was the first thing she did to find out how to do it? Got on YouTube. Well, then her boss found out she learned on YouTube and was like, you didn't look it up from a reputable source, YouTube. And she's like, why would I not go to YouTube? That's easy. For them, they want to learn how to do things themselves, and if they're not getting it in their environment, they're going to find a way to do it. And they get that digital nature of themselves. YouTube is one of their big, biggest resources. And so, again, if we think about how we teach and how we provide education to students, are we providing it in an easily accessible nature where they naturally, naturally go to get it? Or are we making it a little tough for them? We've got to think about it. Because if they're not learning it in the classroom, they're going to figure out how to do it somewhere else, and it's probably going to be from someone on YouTube, when likely. Um, this is also a generation that is known for values, and they're being very purpose-driven. So I love, love, love that you said you notice this generation cares a lot about the why. I'm not going to make y'all watch this video, but Aiden Spencer is a really good example in the 4-H realm of someone who exemplifies this. Um, he won an award within 4-H, a pillar award, which is all about service. Developed a whole project based on something he was passionate about in his community. Had to do with robotics, and it served and gave back to his community. And if you watch the video on YouTube about the, him winning this award, he'll say, I did this because I care about it. It's an issue that's important to me. Can y'all give any examples of your students doing things because it lined up with their values or what they were passionate about? What are some examples? Um, I had some students that had family members that were in the military and they didn't like that they didn't get recognition more than just a couple days a year. So they brought them to care about it. Love it. And they just took the initiative, right, to do that. And they cared about it. They want to be involved in something that has a higher purpose than just to make money or just because we do it because that's how it's always been done. They want to see it benefiting other people and benefiting society as a whole. And I think that is something that is very strong 
and unique to this generation. Other generations, it's not that they haven't done this, but for this generation, it's unique that it doesn't have to be something that they profit off of for it to matter to them. They are also a generation looking for balance. And I think we're seeing this a lot more post-pandemic or whatever we call this era we're in right now, that um, they really rethink a lot about the time that they're being asked to do things. And then does it balance out and are they getting to do other things they enjoy? Um, I mean, I look at this person, I think working or on class, sitting with a dog, enjoying their life in a motor home, traveling the world, right? All the things. They're, they're looking for balance. And so, you know, again, it makes us think about, okay, what are we asking of our students? Are we allowing them to have balance? Is their life out of balance? And how is that affecting, again, their motivation? They also are a generation that wants to break boundaries. Nothing drives this generation more crazy than stereotypes, okay? Um, they may look like a stereotype, but they don't want to be put in that box. And they want to have that ability to have that individuality. And I think this goes back to the fact that they are the most global generation and the most diverse generation. And so again, we need to look at and think about, okay, are we coming to students with assumptions or stereotypes that perhaps they, they didn't ask for? Um, so we need to think about that. And then this generation expects authenticity and transparency. This has been shown a lot more over and over with this generation. They just want, want to be told the truth. Um, and the moment that they detect something isn't genuine, it makes them want to check out, okay? Um, and so they want to openly talk about things. They don't want you to beat around the bush. And they just want you to be genuine, whether that's a good genuine or bad genuine. They just appreciate the authenticity piece there. And so with all of these things to know about this generation that might be a little bit unique, I want us to think about what are some tips and tricks that we can use to better work with our Gen Z students. Um, you know, there's always challenges when it comes to motivating people. And probably the hardest challenge is how do we intrinsically motivate people? You know, rewards and all that are great, but we know it doesn't work over time. So how do we get that switch to flip to where they just want to do it because they enjoy it and it's fun? And so I'm going to put five flip charts up around the room, and I just want to give us some time to kind of brainstorm. And so you can come down, you can grab a marker, and you can just kind of walk down, see what other people put. But the five ways I want us to think about how we can better motivate Gen Z, I want you to think about how can you better motivate them when it comes to CDEs and LDEs, when it comes to learning in your classroom, when it comes to SAE projects, community service, and being involved in your FFA chapter. So let's not go with what we've always done, because maybe what we've always done isn't working so well. But now that we know a little bit more about Gen Z, how could we approach this a little bit differently? Are there any questions? Okay, feel free, again, take a pen. I've got post-it notes up here and markers, and I'll start placing these flip charts around the room.